Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of About the Mafia interviews. Now, this is a very, very special episode. Besides it being our first episode, we also have a very special guest, Mr. John Panisi. How are you today? I'm doing all right. I'm uh, happy to be your first one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an honor. I wouldn't have anyone else. So I say we just, just get right into it. Your background, um, your life growing up. If I was friends with John Panisi in high school, who was John Panisi? Would you like to just give up any how, how it was growing up or if you had oh, any members? <laughs> no, I, I think I was I think I was pretty good in in uh, in high school. I, I wasn't a great student. You know, um, I think we all look back and I wish I could go back, you know, and, and uh, um, get a better education. Um, I stood with, you know, I, I, I stood with guys in there and, you know, I guess you could say we were labeled as not the best guys in, in the school, but we, I don't, I don't know if I would call, call us troublemakers, but, you know, um, we stood with a bunch of guys in, in, in the, uh, in high school. And I, I went to, um, Franklin K lane, which was on the borderline of, uh, Brooklyn and Queens. And, um, you know, I think I was into my girlfriend at the time and, you know, regular uh, high school kid things. Nice. So you said you, you were hanging around at, at that, at that time, were you in gangs? Were you involved in any way or were you kind of doing your own thing? Any getting into any mischief on your own? Cause you're not really connected well, at that point. Well, yeah. I mean, we were, well, we were already going to the, the, the uh, club by John Jr. So we, we were already, um, you know, associating ourselves in that, in that way. So, and people know that, you know, even in high school and that neighborhood, um, we came from Ozone Park, that neighborhood, as people probably heard me say several times already was replete with, um, social clubs. So it was a heavy, uh, you know, there was a big mob presence in, in the neighborhood. So, you know, and any Italian guy in the school usually was connected to somebody or knew somebody or their brother. So it was, that's how it was back then. Yes. And obviously you think that the, the environment has a lot to do with the path you choose in life. Do you think that's a, a um, I do, but I don't, I just, I want to make it clear that I, I don't blame the environment because, because there's plenty of people that came from the environment and did very well legitimately um, but you know, we pick our paths and I obviously didn't pick the straight and narrow path, unfortunately. And so, yes, I mean, the environment did have, um, organized crime around it and, and, and both neighborhoods. Cause I came from both Ozone Park and, and Howard Beach. So those were, you know, heavily, heavily influenced guys in that life for, for everywhere. So in a way it did but we pick our own paths. Gotcha. Now, after high school, we got into a little bit of a problem, you could say. Yeah. Uh, would, would you want to elaborate on uh, your situation when you said, I think you said you were about 20 years old? I had just turned uh, 20 about the week prior. And um, it, you know, it, it was um there was a girl involved and an ex-boyfriend who i who i who i knew too and um and you know unfortunately everything just went wrong that night and um it's worse for the victim um and it was a group of his friends and it was i was you know at this person's house and uh he had come to the house and um you know was very upset and all of that and maybe drinking a little bit with his friends and they you know destroyed the car that I had that I had there and um so to speed it up I, I wind up calling another friend and um it just went terribly wrong after that and the you know he was a young guy um I can say that he really was a was a was a a great guy like you know he was and he was a good guy um you know compared to compared to myself back then 
he was the better guy and he was and he was a good guy you know because he was on a straight and narrow and um very well liked and um unfortunately um when you carry guns people could lose their lives and 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 that's that's what had happened to him and um you know they say if you have a gun on you and you're in a situation nine times out of ten you're going to use it and that's why you you know people shouldn't be walking around with guns and you know that's how these things happen but so that's you know i you know i know you heard before i i don't like talking about it not because i'm hiding anything it's just out of respect for for his family and who have suffered obviously enough enough and you know i just i don't bring it up too much yeah of course of course so you ended up doing 17 years for that incident correct for yes middle. yes okay. um from 1990 and i came home in june of 2007 what was that dynamic like 20 years old going into prison was it it was obviously a culture shock right was was there anything that really you know made you uneasy or uncomfortable in your first few days or anything that stood out to you when you first got in there it is you use a good word because you know um it's just, it's, it's a lot of people have asked me like, you know, how do you describe it? And what was it like? And, and how did you, how did you do that time? And my answer is you would, I could describe it in a way that kind of makes sense. Um, if you had a neighbor, right? Everybody has, well, not everybody, but sometimes people have neighbors that they don't get along with or don't want to be bothered with. Now, if you had not only your neighbor, but the whole block and then the whole surrounding neighborhood that lived with you in your house 24 seven, that kind of is, is what prison is about. It's, it's, it's a, it's about forced company because you don't really don't want to be around these people and they probably don't want to be around you. So it's like forced company. And, um, you know, people have asked, how did you do that time? And how did you day by day? You know, there's no set plan. It's just that you do every day and you, you take it day by day and try to really keep yourself. What I, what I didn't, I don't know if my, if it was like my body rebelling or my mind rebelling, the best thing for someone to do is take advantage of that situation and kind of, you know, um, get involved in programs and, and things like that. And I just didn't want to do anything. And, and my time dragged and I, I, I couldn't get like a pad and, you know, uh, you know, a routine. That's what you need is like a routine. And, and, you know, eventually I did. What, what activities were you involved in? Was it like sporting? Was it more education? Played, um, I tried, what had happened is I tried, I had left a uh, high school with like four credits and I didn't play sports in high school. So they were letting the athletes uh, or the guys that played on the teams graduate owing six credits. But because I didn't play sports, they wanted me to come back. And I said, I'm not coming back. I'm not, I'm not coming back now. And it was stupid because I left and didn't graduate. And I went all the way up to the you know 12th grade. And so the first thing that I did was go right away and get my GED, which I got it. And then I enrolled in college and Back then, Governor Pataki came into office and he was very, very strong. And he he kind of went in on being strict on violent crimes and crimes. And they took away work release from us and they took away all these things. And one of the worst things that I did that I think that they took away uh, was um, college. You know, one of the best ways to rehabilitate somebody is to educate them. So, you know, they took education away and they gave us all withdrawals. So we were in college enrolled and I would say maybe a couple months, two months, and I was enjoying it. And then they made us uh, withdraw. So uh, now I'm walking out of this hearing that we have no college. So, I, and I, listen, I'm not the best talker, but I knew, I said, what am I going to do? Like, you know, I'm going to be a dummy leaving here. So I went to the library and just carry, I used to carry back as many books as I could or they would allow me. And then I had my family and everybody was sending me books and I, I, I ordered a thesaurus 
um, and were a bunch of crossword, crossword puzzles to, you know, learn different words. And I just tried to educate myself the best I could and, um, and writing a lot and, and things like that. And I took a Eastern philosophy course that, that you were allowed to take. And it was a correspondence course. And, you know, that helped me. And I did the best I could as far as killing time that way. So in your personal experience, because this is this is a, you know, a hot debate around the country. Yeah. How, how would you say um, the prison rehabilitated you? Did they do an adequate job? Did they? No, no not at all. No, I. I I got. I have to tell you that I don't know about other states, but you know you can't listen. They do offer programs, right? So, but as far as really trying to rehabilitate somebody, that's on the individual. You know, and I've went to parole boards where they gave me two years and you know hit me and, and, and denied me, and have always told them that I really I rehabilitate myself. You know. Um, at least I thought I did, but I tried everything I could to do myself. You know, they took, they took things away from us, education being uh, the most important. So I think it's on the individual. Interesting. So you're finally let out 17 long years. Now, usually what would happen is first you're connected, you go away, then you come out, decide to go another route, more legit. For you, it appeared that you went in, came out and then actually hooked up with a crime family which would you like to go into uh go into detail on how how that took place that's yeah it's not the way it happened so what happened is it's i kind of did the reverse yeah. <laughs> i got out and i was disgusted and i stood away i actually stood away from the gambino family i stood away from them and i went to work you know, I went and went work construction and I was also on what we would call paper, but I was on parole and I, I did that for about five years. And then um, a guy that I was with, um, Anthony Guzzo, who, who's now a, a member of the Lucchese family, um, had got in touch with me and he was just an associate at the time with a different family, the Columbos. And um he kind of brings me back to going, hanging, hanging out in the street again and going out and meeting. And I really wasn't doing that. I was just kind of minding my business and staying to myself. And as a result of that, we kind of get back into the street and I hook up with another uh, childhood friend of mine, um, Joey DiBenedetto, is, who is uh, Vic Amuso's uh, son-in-law. So he's the boss's son-in-law. And, and through Joey and staying with Joey, Joey now puts me on record with him, which now puts me on record with the Lucchese family. And that's how I, I um, you know, wind up staying with the family and getting to know everybody and then getting inducted myself into the family. So let's talk about that. How, how was the induction ceremony? Obviously, it's a solemn ceremony. Yeah. Um, it's 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 um you know it's it's been depicted in books and spoken about and 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 a lot of it is basically the same with what you may have heard yourself i would say that it is it's definitely very serious you know and um you know there's a gun and a knife and those are real it's a real gun and a real knife that's on a table um and they bring you into a separate room. In our case, we went down into a basement and with chairs and we had to like wait our turn to come up. And, and um, you know, it's, 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 you're going to sit at a table with your administration and other members and, and, and captains or capital regimes, whatever way you want to refer, uh, phrase it. And um, at a table, and this happened to be um, in someone's house in Staten Island. And it was in, a, in the uh, dining room. So we were at a long dining room table. And, um, you know, it's, it's a serious, um, like no one's, everyone has a serious face on and everyone's quiet. You know, there's not, it's whoever's talking, whether it be a, a, a boss, in my case, it was an acting boss, uh, Maddie Madonna, 
or sometimes it could be an underboss, it could be a uh, consigliere, it, it depends. And, um, you know, they'll take you through a series of questions and, and then there's the pricking of the finger and, you know, the whole thing with the saint and, and you know, it's, it's been depicted before and spoken about. Um, it is, you know, Maddie spoke very eloquently and not that I'm trying to glorify the whole thing, but it's, it's funny when the whole saint thing, you know, if you're Catholic or you're religious or whatnot, I, I definitely was uncomfortable with the burning of the saint. Sometimes it's not really a picture of a saint. Sometimes they burn a piece of paper. It's, it, it, this varies from who's doing it, right? And as you as you know, I, I did a whole blog on, on it. And they, you know, the Catholic Church is, is, is actually um, deeming it a, a demonic ceremony. Yes. If you really think about it, it's kind of, you know, it is kind of, if you think about it, I wasn't thinking that way at the time, of course, uh, but, and then at, at, at some point when you go through all of that and, you know, you have the boss at my case, the acting boss in my case is kind of giving me the rules. And it's, it's just ironic that the first rule is what caused all the trouble. And it's that, you're not to go with another member's wife or another member's girl. And, <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, it's ironic that that's what played out later on. But, um, and then we would all kind of lock in there, actually telling you that you're reborn and that now you're born into another family. And now your family that you the family that you know of, like, you know, your own personal family is not your family no more. That we're, we're your family. And we come first. And um, there's even a mention of if you have a child and that child is dying in the hospital and you're at the bedside and we call for you, you're to leave that child and come to us. Now, we've all stood there and answered yes, right? And a lot of us are fathers or what, you know, a lot of us are fathers and were fathers even then. And when we were taking this oath and come on, I mean, who's gonna, we all said yes, but who's gonna, who's gonna do that? Probably none of us, probably not even the guy who's asking you that is gonna do that. So, but you know, it's just part of the whole thing. They do ask you if you know why you're there. And I would say, 80 90 percent of us maybe even more knew why we were there but the answer is always no you can't say yes and um at the end we would lock arms and it's kind of like i think it's called takata it's it's kind of like locking yourself together as one as a group so you're locking into each other and you know you've now become one and that's that's really the whole thing. And then after that is introductions, because you're never formally introduced and you can't be as an associate. And that's when that's the first introductions that you in that life that that someone would go through. And so at some point, there's oh, after that first intro, introduction, you always need the third party. Right. You, like if there's an, another wise guy in you and you don't know each other, there has to be someone who knows both of you to do a third party to do that introduction. So, but that is the first introductions that a person will get. Interesting. It's interesting you brought up the, uh, the Vatican saying that that ceremony has been officially declared a demonic ceremony. Um, on your right. show, we talked a little bit about this. When you take that oath, do you, well, first of all, do you guys keep would wise guys keep track of stuff like that? Like what the Pope is saying about them or would they just, would they yeah. just tell, tell themselves that they're doing God's work and they would just take the oath? They, yeah. I mean, they don't care. They've had, I, and I, I only found this out from, from, uh, you know, looking into um, the, the article. Um, there's actually on the other side, which would either be in, in, in Sicily or Italy where they, would recite some some something before they would go kill somebody, 
and kind of like they're trying to talk to, to God and say that, you know, oh, this person wants to be killed or something crazy to that effect. But so I don't think here that they're even thinking that, about that. And I don't really think they care. Not to say that there's not guys that are religious in their life. There, there are. I just I wouldn't be able to speak for them and know what, what's on their mind. But I guess they just, you know, maybe they must like I always did and do the sign of the cross and, and just pray for forgiveness. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that they're just saying, you know, please forgive me. And every time they go to church or they, whatever, whatever may be the case, but it's a good point that you brought up. Now, speaking of interacting with people on the other side, was there any dealings that you had with people overseas and how, how were they viewed by uh, members in the United States? Were they seen as superior? Were they seen as the real deal or were you seen as kind of equals? Cause you're from the, the same origins. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? I mean, I respected them. Um, they are not seen as superior because we don't recognize them here. Okay. So in other words, if someone from the other side came here, we would respect him, but we, we, wouldn't, we couldn't talk and do business. He, he would have to get inducted in one of, one of the five families. Really? So if you're made on the other side, you're not made in the United States automatically and vice versa? Oh. Wow. Vice versa. Uh, I don't know about vice versa, but definitely here. No, wow. we don't recognize them. So they would have to be re-inducted here. And a lot of them have done that, as, as I'm sure you know, uh, especially now with the Gambino family and the Sicilian faction. I dealt with them a lot, um, um, did business with them, but not overseas. So that to answer that, no, I didn't have any dealings with them overseas, but I the ones that were here, I did intermingle and do business. And I, I, I kind of got along with them and, and, and respected them. I only could speak for myself. Not that I felt they were superior. I just felt that they were doing things right from what I've seen. Interesting. Well, that's, that's a great take because usually from outside the bubble, you hear the opposite, that it's all kind of one unit, right? Where per, a person made on one side is Malbec made the United States and et cetera. But uh, that, that was some great insight. Bringing it back to the United States, um, specifically dealing with you, do you feel like you're in any, any danger today? Are there any extra extra uh, precautions that you take when you go out to the grocery store or wherever, going for a haircut or et cetera? Um, I, I kind of was the same way in that life that I, that I, that I am now. And, and what I mean by that is I was always cautious. Um, it's just that back then, I was on the lookout for the FBI <laughs> and um, I would say that I'm, I'm pretty cautious and I'm very, very aware of my surroundings. And, um, you know, I can't say too much, but I could say that the government does a very good job of keeping tabs and kind of watching my movement and, you know, making sure everything's okay. But, you know, as they say, you know, do what you do. They know that I'm very, I would say, very, very uh, cautious and and um, aware of my surroundings. Um, and, you know, I just watch myself. I, I always feel I could watch myself very good and I'm confident in myself to watch myself. But, you know. I'm not a uh, Superman and, you know, you, you never know in this world. So are, are you like around your neighborhood? Are you, are you involved? Are you, are you more on the down low trying to, you know, are, are you still, how involved are you in everyday life? I guess you would say with this past that you have, well, I, cause we, we spoke just now on, um, on, on how after you got out, um, you, you would act the same way now as you did in that life. Does, does that, does that carry any extra, um, any, any extra, uh, I guess, nuances when you're walking around the neighborhood or anything like that? No, I, what, what I meant by that is that I was very cautious in that life and it's just easy for me. I didn't have to learn to be cautious now. Um, I'm, far removed from that life um i do come in and see uh my children so and sometimes i'm in areas where 
you know, I could run into somebody. I have run into on a few occasions, people. I never had no issues. As a matter of fact, on, on one of the occasions I was in a mall and two guys were walking towards me and they, they know me, they definitely knew me and I knew who they I knew who they were. And they looked and I looked and, and they nodded their head hello and they kept going. And I, I I turned around and I looked and they never even turned around to look behind them. They just kept going about their business. So, um, and there's been, um, you know, Things are not the way they were years ago. Um, like, for instance, you can't put your hand on what we would call a friend in that life, right? And there's been so many things that I've heard of, even to recently, where guys have got hit, guys have got hit with glass, cracked in the face with a glass. There's been all kinds of things that were violations in that life, some by death. And you don't hear nothing it's today we're living in a different world and the cosa nostra or the mob whichever way you want to refer to it is not what it once was that's 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 a definite you know and um but i back to your question i um i'm i'm cautious and i watch what i'm doing and and um you know I go about my life. I'm, I don't, uh, you know, I go about my everyday life and I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And that's that. Speaking of neighborhoods, there's, there's a debate uh, floating around out there. Would you say the neighborhoods were safer when the mob was in its prime? Definitely. Because they were more, you know, don't forget, you know, there's no more social clubs. So now, I can only speak for the neighborhood that I, that I grew up in like Ozone Park and Howard Beach, but the clubs were more in the Ozone Park. Howard Beach was just where everybody lived and it definitely was safe, safer. I told a story recently where the nuns, cause I lived across the street from a church called Nativity and actually one of the head, uh, I don't know if they call it a head nun, but the head sister. And um, she was Joe Torrey's, the baseball manager, um, his sister. She was a sister. I knew her growing. I think her name was Virginia. So um, they had gotten their um, their barbecue stolen. And I think it was Johnny Gotti and them from the club. They sent a message out there, like, you know, and and I guess whoever stole the barbecue didn't know which one belonged to the nuns. They just brought all of them back. It was like 30-something barbecues in their little courtyard. So, you know that kind of sends a big message right there of what life was like back then that they, you know, women, you know, women can walk around and they don't got to worry about anything happening to them and, and whatnot. And it was a, definitely a lot safer. And now these guys are not around in the neighborhoods too much. You know, it's, it's different. There's no social clubs kind of a thing of the past. And it's, it's just, they're not really embedded in the neighborhoods anymore. They live elsewhere. They may meet for dinner and whatnot, but they're not entrenched in the neighborhood anymore. You know, I've done a lot of pondering on what ultimately attracts people to that life. Um, Cause obviously the money, right? The money, the respect, but do you think, cause we, we were just talking about, uh, you know, keeping the neighborhood safe indirectly with just the presence alone. Do you think that that had anything to do with, getting people interested in joining the life, you know, keep being able to keep my people safe or is there any camaraderie like that? I, I think, it, I think it's a combination of things like, you know, a lot of people probably heard in movies that they see flashy cars and don't forget years ago when I was growing up, everybody was in suits. So like, you know, these guys walking around all dressed up in suits, pinky rings and flashy cars and throwing money around. And, you know, that to a young guy, um, definitely plays a big part and then there's the fear you know people feared these people and you know they had preferential cheap treatment in restaurants and and, and all those things i think um come into play but as far as keeping the neighborhood safe that too like you know these guys would if there was a problem and they came everybody knew that yo, know, they came from here they're from this club and 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 to a young um vulnerable mind I think that um, that kind of plays a big part into someone being 
uh, pulled or wanting or wanting to be pulled into that that kind of environment. Oh. Now, what do you think happened to all this? I mean, because it's not like how it how it used to be. What what contributed to the downfall of this? A lot of people say John Gotti. What are your thoughts on on? I the, mean, look, no. you know, I don't know about blaming John Gotti. Like, you know, it, well, people, well, people don't get, look. Look, he didn't didn't help the life, right? But what what people you, what people don't understand is that. He was a dresser and flashy before he really became what he was. He just became an even better dresser and a more expensive dresser, and, you know. And um, it, you should shun the spotlight in that life. And um, he could have did a better job at doing that, and he didn't. And that's why a lot of people blame him. But it, it, it's not only him. It, it, it was a lot of things, and you know. It, it's just that I, I would say that the government kind of took, took them down. I don't, I don't think the mob even knows they're taken down yet, but the, the government did a number on them. And, um, and what, you, what you lose, you lose the old timers. And the more that, as in anything, right, the more that you lose in baseball, Right. There's still baseball, but if you watch baseball years ago or boxing, boxing's a better one. If you watch boxing uh, on you know some films or you watch some YouTube and you watch the old matches, these guys were great. And that so now they were old times and they died off some of them, and some of them were just old guys and they retired and whatnot. Not to take away anything from the boxes of today, right? You know, they're all great guys and, and great athletes, but they're not who these guys were. So you start losing that, right? And it's the same thing, I think, with the mob. They lost all the heavy hitters and they lost all the old timers and mostly to getting locked up in cases. And, and, and when you lose that, you're losing the, the values that they had back then and you know these are guys a lot of them did and a lot of them didn't but most of them did follow the rules that were in place and you know rules are in place for a reason and compared to today and i'll personally speak on this um they're breaking the rules you know and that kind of changes everything and the government knows that and the government uses that to their advantage now, technology, right? The growth of technology, exponential increase. You're like even you said it yourself when you went in, went into prison, came out. You said it was like you're stepping off on the moon or Mars. I forgot exactly what you said. Like yeah, it was like they dropped me from the spaceship, right? And the the technology that they had back then was good, right? They 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 were bugging even. Um, uh, parking meters, right? And that's all high tech. But someone told me a story, and it's a pretty good one. And it was about he used to walk his dog with a DEA agent, a retired one. So the guy went back to his office, and he told the guy, he says, "Boy, I went back to my office, and I, I said to one of my old friends, what are these guys all doing at their desk? Why aren't they out in the field?" And the guy laughed at him and said, "They don't need that. They just go." They track everybody through their cell phones and that's just them. The, the government, the FBI, I mean, they're just so high tech that it's, you can't beat them. You know, you just can't beat them. But what they're able to do is unbelievable. And, and the public itself, everyone has cameras, there's cameras everywhere and people will pull out a phone and you may be on YouTube, you know, they, or on what's the other TikTok. You'll be on something. You never know what you're going to be on. You you, you see that, you know, there are people are filming people all the time, and it's just it's hard today. It's Actually, very that, hard. that brings up an interesting point. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, okay. But Joey Merlino in Philadelphia, some people call him the Instagram Don. Because appara apparently he's on there. He's on there. He's active and he loves it. He's taking pictures of everyone he used. To, he has his restaurant in uh, 
in Florida. Uh, what do you, what do you say? What do you say to that? You know, mobsters have an Instagram pages and what do you say to that? I mean, I never in that life, I didn't have no social media, nothing. Um, and believe that was the way it should be. Um, and it's funny that you bring that up. There's this kid, this Peter Pan Tuccio, who's in trouble with this awesome case. Yeah. I introduce him to Joey Molino one night. Really? And how people are asking, like, how did he get to Joey Molino? And how did he you know how? That night he DMs a boss of a crime. Think about what think about this, what you're saying. Here's a young punk kid in the street, right? DMing a boss of a crime family in Philadelphia and start corresponding and sending the kid in around center pitch. That's how he gets to know him. What? That is a good sign of what the... Mo- I got one better. Do you think Peter Tuccio or any kid like him would be able to DM... Paulo Gambino would be able to even in Philadelphia, Nikki Scoffo, um, Pony Ducks, never happened. Those guys wouldn't even have those pages. So that's right? we kind of answering your question yeah. just in that alone. And I happen to like Joey. Um, you know, I don't have nothing against him, I happen to like him, but I knew that at the time and just shook my head. Like, wow. Yeah, with that case, he's actually he's in big trouble. Uh, that that Tuccio, he, what is he? He's looking at ten years for uh, lighting someone's Mercedes on fire. And it was superseding indictments on that case, and, and they and, had more. And, more. and, his and buddy, um, I speak to a lot of people, right? And people in that neighborhood and 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 everything. We, they, you know, they all reach out. Um, and surprisingly, you know, from what I get, and this is from this is from them. This ain't from me. This from these people telling me, they said, you know, people speak very highly of you still to this day. Um, and, you know, as you know, like stories come out and the truth comes out, but, but no one speaks highly of that kid. Everyone that I talked to, everyone in that life, everyone when I was in that life, nobody had nothing good to say about that kid. You know, Gene Barello. And he's still, to this day, causing trouble. <laughs> this guy's on bail. Still causing trouble. You know, with Instagram and there's different things that I've heard that I'm not going to mention because I don't want the person to, you know, they'll know who it is. Still causing trouble today, to this day. You would think by now you're facing 10 years, you're in a shitload of trouble, choose my language, and you're still causing trouble. So, you know, we, we do that. You know, uh, Gene Barella, who just went away again, um, he he called him a wannabe. Do, do you think there's a problem of or of this epidemic of wannabe gangsters because of what they see in the movies and what they see in real life? Do you think that that's still an issue today? You know, I, I'm going to say this, and I, I think that you would understand it, and for anybody listening, will. At one point, the whole mob was wannabes, obviously, right? And and so for me to knock him and call him a wannabe is, is being a hypocrite because at one time I was wannabe. And, 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 and I think everybody, um, my mother's uncle used to stay with uh, Danny and Charlie Wagner's Fatico, right. That people heard that's who brought uh, uh, Johnny Gotti in, right. Was not John Gotti a wannabe when he was a younger guy trying to get around these older guys. He wasn't a, a wise guy yet. So at one time we were all wannabes. And I think that, yes, there's still wannabes out there. Um, I would hope that after listening to a lot of offs now that are speaking about this life, um, I would hope that they would take a, uh, you know, a better look at what they uh, want to be. Um, But you know, that's on them. Every, we all pick our, our pants. You know, that's that's a great take. I think this is a good segue into our last section here in our last few minutes. Um, my favorite podcast on YouTube, Valuetainment, does this called The Lightning Round. I'm just going to say a name that you yep. may or may not know. 
And mm -hmm. I'd like you just to describe or say a few words, the first words that come to your head when thinking about this person. You could pass if you would like, yep. uh, you know, it's whatever you're comfortable with. But I'm just going to list off a few names, okay. say a few words about what you think of them, and uh, we'll wrap up with some finishing thoughts. All right. All right. First name, John Gotti. Infamous. <laughs> um infamous and um i've said it a whole bunch of times a gangster when he woke up in the morning and a gangster when he went to sleep at night and a gangster to his last breath anthony arelata anthony arelata very intelligent definitely boss material um good good business mind and um a friend I, I i i i like anthony jerry capecci um jerry capecci i think he is a great writer and he um can really put a story together and it's and it put a different twist on it he's an old timer in the game and i have to respect that um you know and listen he's got uh, gangland's uh, a big one out there and um I, I i i respect them i had my little issue with them but i i i, I respect them sammy the bull gravano um aged definitely aged um i would definitely say uh first of all he was a powerhouse in the life um yeah. he definitely is taking things in a business uh with a business mind and he seems to be doing very well with himself and very well with with his podcast and he has a couple of things that he's doing now he's branching out more and um you know he's doing his thing been through a lot obviously in that life joseph amato should have listened to me um <laughs> i told him to get to take that um gps off of that car he didn't listen um i always liked joey um and it's unfortunate that he got jammed up he's not getting younger mm -hmm. and 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 also a a tough guy gangster okay just a few more here michael franzis um businessman um another guy that kind of takes what he's doing to other levels um very very good and intelligent in business and kind of was like a pioneer in this whole podcasting and and youtube and 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 interviews and and uh he done for he, he has done very well for himself and i wish him the best anthony hootie russo pass john a light or elite um john john also surprised me john um is doing very well for himself and has a business mind and is is um kind of you know going with the punches he lost his uh co-host um he um he, he's made money before he'll make money again um and uh you know John's in his own in his own in his own league and does things his way. Um, and I think he's gonna do very well. He's he's into like he's into everything. So he's he's doing a lot, and I always wish him the best. Excellent. Well, that's all I have for names. Um, I appreciate all your your input on what we've spoken with today. Would you like to close out with any closing thoughts before we end? Um, my closing thoughts are that I think that you're doing a great job and yep. um I think everybody should, you know, go check out the about the mafia.com and, and you, you, you put it together nicely. You're a good writer and you're a gentleman. And it's, you know, it's a pleasure. It was a pleasure to meet you on, on our show. And, uh, and, and I just want to say that for the people that don't know, and I always say this about you, you reached out to bring me on and, and my partner, Tom winds up, turning it and, and having you come on and I and I do commend you for that and that's why you're a gentleman you came on Oz and then 
that's why I had to come, you know, I definitely had to return, re return the favor and it was a pleasure to do so. So I just want to take my hat off to you and tell you that I wish you nothing but the best, anything I could do for you, I will. And um, I'll definitely always push your, your uh, content out there. Thank you to you as well. Like they say, you know, the best teaching is experience, right? So Absolutely. what I'm going to do is I'm going to link all of your stuff in the description, your website, sitdownnews.com. I'm going to link your YouTube channel. Do you have any other thing on any other socials you um, want to check out? Yeah, I have, I have the, so you, as everyone knows that we're on, I'm on the NBA and the button, man, I'm partnered with Tom Lavecchia and I just started the sit down news on you on YouTube. And I have only done one and I, I'm, it's, it's basically going to talk about article, uh, blog posts that I put down. All right, John. Well, again, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a pleasure. And I wish you well in your, your ventures going forward. And hopefully we talk again soon. Thank you. And it was, thanks for having me on. It was nice to be here.